But there are also false prophets among the people, just as there will be false teachers among you. They will secretly introduce destructive heresies, even denying the sovereign Lord who brought them, bringing swift destruction on themselves. Many will follow their depraved conduct and will bring the way of truth into disrepute. In their greed, these teachers will exploit you in fabricated stories. Their condemnation has long been hanging over them and their destruction has not been sleeping. For if God did not spare angels when they sinned, but sent them to hell, putting them in chains of darkness to be held for judgment. If he did not spare the ancient world, when he brought the flood on its ungodly people, but protected Noah, a preacher of righteousness, and seven others, if he condemned the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah, but burning them to ashes, and made them an example of what is going to happen to the ungodly, and if he rescued Lot, a righteous man, who was distressed by the depraved conduct of the lawless, For that righteous man, living among them day after day, was tormented in his righteous soul by the lawless deeds he saw and heard. If this is so, then the Lord knows how to rescue the godly from trials and to hold the unrighteous for punishment on the day of judgment. This is especially true of those who follow the corrupt desire of the flesh and despise authority. Bold and arrogant, they are not afraid to heap abuse on celestial beings. Yet even angels, although they are stronger and more powerful, Do not heap abuse on such beings when bringing judgment on them from the Lord. But these people blaspheme in matters they do not understand. They are like unreasoning animals, creatures of instinct, born only to be caught and destroyed, and like animals they too will perish. They will be paid back with harm for the harm they have done. Their idea of pleasure is to carouse in broad daylight. They are blots and blemishes, reveling in their pleasures while they feast with you. With eyes full of adultery, they never stop sinning. They seduce the unstable. They are experts in greed and a cursed brood. They have left the straight way and wandered off to follow the way of Balaam, son of Beza, who loved the wages of wickedness. But he was rebuked for his wrongdoing by a donkey, an animal without speech, who spoke with a human voice and restrained the prophet's madness. These people are springs without water and mist driven by a storm. Blackest darkness is reserved for them. For they mouth empty boastful words, and by appealing to the lustful desires of the flesh, they entice people who are just escaping from those who live in error. They promise them freedom, while they themselves are slaves of depravity, for people are slaves to whatever has mastered them. If they have escaped the corruption of the world by knowing our Lord and Saviour Jesus Christ and are again entangled in it and are overcome, they are worse off at the end than they were at the beginning. It would have been better for them not to have known the way of the righteousness than to have known it and then to turn their backs on the sacred command that was passed on to them. Of them the proverbs are true. A dog returns to its vomit and a sow that is washed returns to her wallowing in the mud. Um, mighty God we pray for Ben we lift up Ben to you right now we say thank you Lord for your word let it move in power and thank you Lord that as you send out your word it will not return void Amen. Amen. okay it's heavy isn't it that last bit um, but I'm going to try and unpick this in a way that's encouraging so start off by saying good afternoon Telford Minster good afternoon. yes much better than this morning much better than this morning. This morning, it was only Matt. Anyone that's worked in schools know if you say good afternoon, um, you get this drone back. Like this noise, good afternoon. Mr. And no matter how hard you try to say it differently, you get swept up in the current of that noise and that good afternoon. So I'm going to come at this very much from my background, which is in education. So I've spent around 10 years now in education, um, teaching at a pri- local primary school. And this passage is quite daunting when you first start looking at this passage because you think oh I don't want to be one of those people that returns to their vomit at the end this but there's a real key bit at the beginning and we're going to look at Peter through almost like an educational lens we're going to look at him um, what sort of learner was he what sort of person was he what can we learn practically from his example 
Um, this holds a key to how this verse is so relevant. So I was sat here this morning and um, I thought, well, it's the first time I've ever spoken in front of church. I've done lots of public speaking, but never in front of a church. So I was really, really apprehensive. And all week I knew people were praying for me. I knew people from my village, and if you're not attached to a village, you definitely should, they're amazing, um, were praying for me. And every time I thought that I was worried, I just kept hearing the same verse again. The Spirit just reminded me, God did not give us a spirit of fear, but a spirit of adoption, by which we call him Abba, Father. And it's like that truth, and I'm going to keep coming back to that, because that truth holds the power over whether we're going to be swept up by heresies, whether our faith is going to be destroyed from what we hear. So go on to this afternoon again. So the service is finished. I'm thinking, oh, I'm going to go home now. Mother's Day sandwiches. So tick that box. First sermon ticked. Second bit, Mother's Day ticked. But God really said to me, I want you to stay and I want you to listen. Because what God asked me to do is you've just spoken to everyone about how you should use all your mind. I want you to use all yours now. I want you to listen. And that's part of what we're going to unpick here really is about how we can guard ourselves against these false teachers. This message now is more relevant than it's ever been. We were told I'm a millennial. Much, it's almost like a tag you don't want really. But I'm a millennial. And he spoke this afternoon. Joe came to the front and he said... We millennials spend roughly, if you're aged between sort of 35 to 50, roughly speaking, you spend three hours of your life on your phone. Now, I would say that in that three hours of your life, many of you might go on Facebook Reels. If you're interested in Christianity and that comes up, then those clever algorithms will try and persuade you to listen to them. And you'll end up hearing more than ever those destructive heresies which Peter is talking about. So this whole letter really is a warning because this isn't new. The battleground isn't new of your mind. It's not a new thing. This is something that the enemy has been waging war on your minds and our minds now since the beginning, since Eden, since the beginning, since the fall. He wants your mind. If he can control that mind, he can plant things there and they can go here. And once they're here, they're really hard to unlodge. So I do encourage anyone... If there's a truth that you've heard or something false spoken over your life, please come forward and get prayer from one of the team before the end. So these churches at the time were scattered across Asia Minor, Asia Minor which is modern-day Turkey, essentially, and it was part of the Roman Empire. And there's actually seven churches. And Peter, at this point in his life, is deeply, deeply concerned by what is happening there. So... We're going to unravel Peter a little bit. We're going to unravel what he was like as a man. And that's going to really guide us into how we can guard ourselves against these heresies and this false teaching. But really, the false teaching he's talking about, and Paul, goes, Paul talks about it, Jesus talks about it with the Pharisees, is they are, you're saved. Okay, we've heard it, we pray, we sing the songs with Jesus. You've redeemed us through your death and your resurrection. We understand that. We understand that truth. If you don't understand that truth, then speak to someone in church that can help you go through that process. But really what Peter's talking about is being holy doesn't matter. These people are saying at this point, and Paul has the same thing, these churches are moving away from their accountability as Christians. He's fighting against an absolute wave of people saying, um, don't worry about your sexual sin, your depravity. You can carry on. Jesus has done it. You're not going to be accountable in the end. And Peter's really, really concerned about that. And this passage is quite scary, really, because you think, well, I don't want to be that person that goes back and I don't want to be swept up in that. And we all sin and fall short of the glory of God. But Peter gives us a clue in this passage. Peter says they will secretly introduce destructive heresies even denying the sovereign Lord. So there's a clue there, points to Jesus. Many will follow their depraved conduct and bring the way of truth into disrepute. What is the way of truth? The way of truth is Jesus. So I've actually seen this with children. So I've seen children, and this isn't just, I'm going to give you an example, but this isn't just one child. 
This is year after year after year. You see children who have had some sort of false truth spoken over them. You're naughty. You're rude. He's so, such a rude boy. He's so, they're, such, they're so violent. And we had examples where, and my teaching assistant is fantastic. I've encouraged her to listen to this because I said I'm going to mention it. It's just getting those, it, unpicking that from their heart is so hard. It's so deep. It's gone into their heads. They've heard it so many times. And then it's taken a seat in their heart. Then what happens? Their behaviour comes out of that from their heart. What goes in, what you, you are what you eat, what goes in, sits there, dwells there, and pours forth all those behaviours. But I have seen children within the space of five or six weeks, if you tell them that they are loved, and no matter what they do, they are loved. If that is their identity, if that truth is seats in their heart, you can literally unpick all that's come before. And... Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. Knowing the truth will set you free. What are we being freed from? Peter's talking about it here. What are we being freed from? Sin. That is what we're being freed from. And he's pressing the people of this church. You are free from your sin. Don't wallow in it again. Don't go back there. The gospel is the truth. Jesus died with our sin, with our corrupt nature, and he was resurrected. But we don't live on the, we don't live at the moment that he died. We live in resurrection. We live in that truth. And if we live in that truth, we must commit our minds to knowing that truth more and more and more. And I'm going to look now at Peter himself. And I'm going to look at how does knowing Peter's life and journey help guard our minds and our heart because it's all in the mind if we allow those truths to go into our mind they're going to seat themselves in our hearts so this letter all the letters of Peter so I learned a little bit this afternoon with Matt so Matt said if you look at the opening of the two letters they have a different opening so what scholars have refuted I've actually refuted said we don't think he wrote it why don't they think he wrote it well he was a fisherman he was not Paul, the Pharisee of Pharisees, as someone said this afternoon again. He was not learned in the law. He was not a Matthew, who clearly had a mind for detail, quite a shrewd, clever man. He was a tax collector. In Acts 4, we're told, the men, they were unschooled, ordinary men, and they took note that they had been with Jesus. They had been with Jesus. Peter had been with Jesus. He's a great example to us as a, as from an educator looking at him thinking, he is just a fantastic student. He spent three years with a man. But I want to ask you, what commandment do you think Peter, and I'm going to come back to this later, I just want you to think about this. What commandment do you think Peter embodied the most? What commandment did he really, 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 really focus on? So, if we see Peter as a learner, as a disciple, as a teacher, we can learn to guard ourselves against these heresies. He has done something that, and we also see that Noah is mentioned in this passage. We see that Lot is mentioned in this passage. And I'm going to come back to them in a minute. So, looking at Peter's life, he's 30 when Jesus calls him. Roughly speaking, they think he was around 30. And Jesus says to him, be a fisher of men. So, he becomes a fisher of men. He was crucified around 68 AD, and they think these letters were written in around 65 AD. And I'm going to correct the record from this morning because I actually said, when people get to a certain age, they become wise. Now, we think that they think that Peter was around 60 when he wrote these letters. Now, I used Jem this morning. Jem is not 60. He's 57. But I really relate to Peter, and I need people like Jem around me, or I need people around me like Lauren, because I am a bit of a feet-first sort of person. I'll just jump into things, and then Lauren will go, slow down. Or I'll say, I'll have, the, I'll have some scripture, and Jem say, yeah, but do you know what that means? There's a practical bit to it. And, Jesus, and Peter says things like, far be it from you, Lord, that shall never happen to you. He's literally saying, Jesus has just professed that he's going to die, he's gonna, he's, and he's going to be resurrected. And Peter's saying, 
no, 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 not you, God. And he goes, get behind me, Satan. I mean, that is some rebuke. That is some telling off. But there's something about that, the honesty in Peter's words, the way he challenges and speaks, that we can learn to guard ourselves from the false teachings that Peter talks about. So as an educator, I completely disagree that he didn't write these letters. He's a really good learner. He asks questions. Now, we know he asks questions because it's in the, in the Gospels, but he says things that are on his mind. He's prepared to challenge, we see that in Acts. But he's also really reflective. He thinks, but what does he think about? What commandment does he dwell on? What does he do? And what commandment is it that he, dwell on, that he dwells on in his heart? So I just want you to think, even the Gospels, we get a snapshot of what it was like. I've just got a picture of Peter in my head, just constantly, you know, like when children are tapping you and they're going, Jesus, what's this? What's the answer to this? I've got this picture in my head of Peter being that sort of person, a natural learner, someone that wants to know more. But Peter, in that passage, it says the way of truth into disrepute. Jesus was the way of truth and Peter knows this. So all that bit afterwards, the bit that worries people in this passage, you need to know the truth. What commandment did he embody? Love the Lord God with all your heart. Now, I've just, it was amazing, sat there, listening to people worship, hands in the air. I think most people have got that. All your soul, yeah, I see that. All your mind. Do you love Jesus and God with all your mind? Are you dedicating that three hours to your phone or to Jesus? Are you meditating on his word day and night as David does? Why, were, why are Noah and Lot men of God? What do you think they did? They embodied that truth. Find me one person of, of God, great man or woman of God, that doesn't embody the idea that you use your mind. The mind is an amazing thing. I've seen it every day. The mind can transform lives. But if you put the wrong thing in and it sits in your heart, then that will pour out. Jesus talks about the fruit of the Spirit. That's what that is. So, if we look at that aspect of the mind, we're given some clues in the actual passage itself. Pass verse 20, if they escape the corruption of the world by knowing our Lord and Saviour, Jesus Christ, and are again entangled and overcome, they are worse off in the end than they were at the beginning. Knowing our Lord Jesus Christ. Now there's two, three different words, essentially, in Greek, linked to knowing. One is gnosis, one is gnosko, and they're verb tense issues. But they mean to understand or grasp something. Lauren, Lauren's laughing because she's like, you're such a geek, Ben. Like, the fact that you know that. <laughs> so, Peter, Paul and Jude are fighting against this idea that key knowledge that saved. So Peter, Jude, Peter and Jude are talking about um, a different type of knowledge than another word that's used, which is epic. I've got twice. I got the pronunciation wrong. Epignosis. Now that is decisive knowledge of God, which is implied in the heart of Christianity. Okay, so that's taking a seat in the heart. But here, Peter's using the word gnosis which means that the knowledge can be acquired. That means that you can acquire that knowledge. So a lot of people go through this process of becoming a Christian, where, and I certainly did, where you're saved and you think you're saved. And then you just allow nothing to happen. You don't give your mind over to it. And I can tell you now that God, by his grace and mercy, has pulled me out of the pit again. But now I'm God in my mind because I know that those things destroyed my faith or nearly destroyed my faith. So be on guard with your mind. So, is there any justification for this idea of getting your mind right through the teachings of Jesus? So now, people will say, the difference between a Pharisee and 
The, Christian, the Holy Spirit, that's the big difference, isn't it? The Holy Spirit lives in you, you're a temple of the Holy Spirit. But Jesus says, John 14, 26, but the advocate, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, will teach you all things, and this is the key, and will remind you of everything I have said to you. If you have an ability to read and to understand, or even if you don't, you're in a body of Christ here, you're in a body, you're in a church, seek someone that does know. You have an obligation to commit your mind to the truth. We are reminded. And again, I'll ask you, do you use all your mind to love God? How much of your mind do you spend dwelling on this truth? And again, last night, I knew what I was going to say today, roughly speaking. (laughs) It's turned out slightly differently, which is fine. I went to listen to one of my audio books. And the Holy Spirit said, why aren't you listening to my word? Because you're about to speak on that, and yet you're not listening to that. So I did. So why is it so important, this battle? Satan is not asleep. The enemy isn't asleep. He's subversive. He will offer you things that almost sound true. On those Facebook reels, on those YouTube reels, it'll almost sound real or true. But it's not the truth. We can discern what that truth is by going back to the word of God, to the gospels, and listening to those truths. And Peter says, false teachers are among you, secretly bringing in their destructive heresies. We live in a world of false teaching. We live in a world that's trying to make truth out of itself without God, and it's going wrong, and it will always go wrong. Don't forget the truth. We live in the resurrection and we are not, it is no longer, we're not living in the death or wages of our sin. So, what can we do about it? So, we can love God with all our heart, all our soul and all our mind. God demonstrates his own love for us in this, why we were sinners, Christ died for us. That's the truth. Commit it to your heart. Remember it. Memorise it. So I've got... um, My stepdad, I asked him again, I said, do you mind me sharing what's happened to you? He's got stage four bowel cancer and it was a real um, sudden shock to the family. He's almost like um, a bit of a rock. He's a bit of a Peter, if you like, pretty solid guy. And it really was a shock to us. And my mum's been a Christian all her life and she heard the news and the first thing she texted me was, for we are more than conquerors through Christ who loves us. This Holy Spirit, in that moment, reminded my mum of that promise, that verse. But you have to remember that verse. You have to have them seated in your mind. They seat in your mind, they seat in your heart, and they become truths. So, guard your mind. So, again, this afternoon, I was like, what am I, am I going to change what, what I did this morning? How is that going to be different? Well, I stayed for the work from the Billy Graham workshop and there was some really practical advice. One of the things was you hear, okay? So you're hearing now. Some of you might be quite passive when you're hearing. We're quite good at sitting there and being quite passive when we're hearing. You read, engage with the scriptures, go home and read. Or read with someone that understands the scriptures. Get involved in a village, go to the theology discussion group. Speak to one of the leaders in the church. You study. What does it mean? What could it mean? And I saw something amazing. The Bible is the most hyperlinked book in the world. But what does it all point to? Jesus. Genesis. Crush your head. It's there all the time. Jesus, Jesus. Numbers. You read that when you become a Christian, you think, what's this got to do with Jesus? And you think... Well, it has, because he's done all that for me. He's done all that for me, and I'm living in that. I've got his spirit. So, memorise verses. Memorise key verses. Seat it in your heart. Meditate on it. And this is what came out today. Meditate on it. Don't just take it, just memorise it. Because the Pharisees memorised the law. 
but it did nothing. It didn't seat in their hearts. It enables you to do some quite amazing things. It guards you from false teaching. It helps you to evangelize. It helps you in moments of crisis. And I've got all this going on. I've got this, don't mind me saying to you, Lauren's got all health stuff going on as well. It's, but at work, like, how are you so calm? Well, Jesus, he's a cornerstone. We sang at the start. It's Jesus. That's the truth. So all the bit that comes after about returning to vomit, you can avoid it by loving God with all your heart, all your mind, and all your soul. But the mind is so, so, so key. Um, can I just ask anyone, sorry, that feels as if there's something spoken over them, maybe when they were younger, maybe um, recently, that they feel is a destructive thing? Has it taken a seat in your heart? Please come forward and you'll be prayed for. Thank you.